on. When when did it become a big issue for the Jewish community? That's a question. You need to be unmuted to answer it. When did when did civil disobedience and protest become a big issue within the Jewish community? Korach. Korach. Oh, okay. So we're going we're going back and biblical. All right. That's um. Um, what was, what was the, uh, was that civil disobedience? No, it was protest. That was definitely protest, yes. What, what about the golden calf? Was that civil disobedience? It was protest. Yeah. It's protest. 1948. What's the difference between civil disobedience and protest? There's a law that you're protesting against. Oh, protesting against a law is which? If you break the law deliberately, That's, knowing that you're breaking the law in protest. Right. So, so one of the... The, 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 difference is, the difference is between a terrorist and a freedom fighter. So is that, is, is, are, are you saying, are you saying um, that, that it's just semantics? Yes. Point of view. Right. Okay. So, as a as an area of writing within the Jewish world, it became something that was discussed substantially in America in the Vietnam era, when people were being. Um, that's not to say it's the first time anybody thought about it, obviously, but it became an area of writing, a, st a field of study during the Vietnam era, when people were wondering whether or not, because of opposition to the war, they could refuse the instructions to um, the, the, the conscription, I mean, whether by going off to Israel, as many did, or overseas, as many did, um, or just facing the consequences at home. It became a, an area of study which then looked back at and created some kind of doctrine out of um, <coughs> out of the pre-existing sources. I, it clearly wasn't the first time anybody had ever thought about it. There's a lot of literature that addresses it, but not really conceptually. Um, it also became a very big area, and there's a fair amount that's written um, that came up at the time of the Gaza withdrawal where you have the um, people in orange demonstrating against uh, what Israel was doing from within. There hadn't been huge opposition to uh, various political actions within Israel, and certainly the Oslo Peace Accords and everything else. But civil disobedience as an area of research became very significant again when we hit the, uh, when we hit the Gaza withdrawal. In terms of protest, um, you know, I, I, I spoke I spoke in shul and upset some people. I often do, that, anyway. but I spoke in shul and upset some people um, at the time of the Charlottesville discussions um, or, or uh, riots um, and uh, about taking down statues, and uh, pointed out the pointed out the uh, fact that for the Jewish community, we have got mixed opinions about statues for some of England's great kings who may have been good for the country but bad for the Jews. Uh, how do we feel about Nazi officers or German officers um, having their statues up? How do Germans feel about uh, um, about Boma Harris's statue. Do we? How do we judge people? It's before we even get to uh, the, the, the the Cecil Rhodes stuff and everything else that's going on. Um, and and I said I've still got some kind of respect for history and tradition that makes it very difficult for me to think of getting rid of a statue of Richard the Lionheart. Um, even though he was certainly not our great hero, good though he was in the Robin Hood story, and Robin Hood, who favoured him over wicked King John, um, was on the wrong side of history as far as the Jews were concerned. John was certainly far better for us than Richard. Um, so, 
you know, the way we view history, we still have a, a, a sentimental attachment to things. It's become a little bit more personal over the last uh, few months as there is discussion in Germany about renaming a street in Wiesbaden, which is named after a Nazi supporting composer and removing the name from the street of the Nazi supporting composer and renaming it in favor of my great grandfather, who was a Wiesbaden based composer, Wiesbaden born composer, who lived there and had some local celebrity. And that would be a good thing to do. You have no idea, aside from the, uh, I mean, the idea of taking away the, uh, the historic name of the street and the emotions that go with denazification um, and changing culture or imposing a liberal Jewish culture or a liberal black culture or whatever it is on a community aside from those passions the biggest protest comes from the post office and everybody else who needs to get postcodes and everything else rearranged because street names are very much defined and ubiquitous. <laughs> so you know things are not always as straightforward as they are emotional and it's a discussion within the family what we would want to do about the particular street names and it's it's, it's not up to us um, but would we have a view so while we are ripping down statues of slavers, what are we supposed to do with, and I'm just going to share something on the screen for a second. Um, who, who knows what these statues are? And there's a bonus mark if you can tell me where these ones are. Um. Uh, uh, I think that's the Eleanor Cross. Is it the Eleanor Cross? And is it Queen uh, Eleanor and King uh, Edward? No, it isn't. They're both women, but thank you, Simon. Aren't they outside a cathedral somewhere? I can't remember which one. They are outside a cathedral somewhere. They're outside many cathedrals, but the bonus mark's only if you tell me which one it is. Uh, Lincoln? No. No, I give up. So they're outside the cathedral. Um, is my is my cursor is my is my cursor on the shared screen? Yes. You see the hand moving around. Okay. Yeah. So there you see the cross of Ecclesia representing the church. They're in synagogue. The broken staff of synagogue representing the Jewish world. Ecclesia upright, beautiful, in a robe with the chalice. Um, and um, not blindfolded, um, synagogue broken in a plain or sometimes torn robe with a book down. So this is a supported chalice, the cup of Christ, the, and the um, Old Testament held down. There are many representations here. This one's outside Strasbourg Cathedral. But it's, uh, it's a famous image that you'll find in many, many cathedrals. And it was a way of portraying the Christian world their superiority and a way of highlighting to passing Jews who had to look high up at that, you know, we are constantly broken. Now, with the spirit of the age, are we supposed to go around to every medieval cathedral and suggest that these be taken down? Um, I, I understand the passion, the symbolism, the pain, the persecution, and everything that's gone with these, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I, 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 I have huge sympathy for taking down the statues of, uh, of, of, of slavers. Um, but, but what do you do with that? How much do you dismantle that these symbols exist? And perhaps, perhaps we should be mounting a protest. I mean, perhaps let me just change my screen behind me for a second. Um, hang on one second. Uh, if if uh, you look up here, this is um, one of, this is a very famous picture in uh, Winchester Cathedral. And here you can see this is one of the, in the North Transept, this is one of the oldest images of a Jew painted into the cathedral walls from the, uh, 13th century, I think it is, uh, or painted on top of an arch. And you can see the Jew there with his hat. And uh, can, you, can you work it out? You can't see where my mouse is pointing there. You can see the Jew there with his hat and, and beard, um, one of several cartoons of Jewish living. 
um, in an area showing the, um, the Pharisees' bad treatment of Jesus. And again, an image that was supposed to inculcate into everyone present the idea of the... Uh, the idea of the superiority of Christianity, and the inferiority of the Jewish world. So protest at these things is um, is, a, is an idea that might indeed. Uh, you can see it well. Hang on. Did, did, let, let me just shut, put, put that back for a second. Did, um, sorry. Uh, if you, if you got me. Mm -hmm. so Spotlight in now, you'll see it even clearer. Um, but you can see the image, and um, it was a way of demeaning the world in the eyes of the Christians around. Are we supposed to go into Winchester Cathedral with our Dulux paint or spray cans and get rid of it? Um, or do we preserve a historic record and make sure that it's clearly signposted? So there is a discussion to be had on how we respond to hurt the very that's direct action you're that's, talking about direct action rather than that's, that's, to protest. Be that's protest thanks Irene that's protest as opposed to yes. civil disobedience civil disobedience may or may not be direct and we'll ha we'll have a look at the sources now so so if you look at um the one of the earliest sources that we highlight on civil disobedience um, on the first page. Are you going to share something with us? Yeah, I've sent out the, the thing, um, a, a message. Please could, please could people mute them, only unmute when you wish to interject, because there's a little bit of cutter coming through. So I will share this, I will share this document with you so that you're looking um, at the same as me. Hi. Um, on your phone, I didn't download it. Mm -hmm. what? So we have the midwives in Egypt, um, one of the first key cases of um, hang on, hang on a second, of of disobedience. What happens in what do the midwives do that makes them particularly noteworthy and disobedient? They don't, they don't kill the baby boys. The children. They don't kill the baby boys. So we've got the two midwives who may or may not be midwives to the Hebrews or Hebrew midwives. Sorry, that's my printer. Um, they, oh, wait a second just for that to finish. Sorry about the noise there. So you've got... You've got the midwives who um, may or may not be Hebrews themselves. Clearly, Yocheved and Miriam is uh, one of the understandings of who Shifra and Pua are. And they are told to kill the baby boys as they are born. Um, but it says they feared Hashem. They didn't do what the king of Egypt commanded them and saved the baby boys alive. Um, and the consequence of that, they, they, they present an excuse when they're told, why have you done this thing? Is that the, the, the Egyptian women aren't like the Egyptian men. They're vigorous. They give birth before the midwife gets to them. You know, by the time we have arrived, I, no, no Jewish father whose wife has been in labor, very few Jewish fathers whose lives have been in labor have experienced uh, something as quick as that. As soon as you call the midwife, the baby has appeared. But here, the, the, the excuse was that every time the, a boy is born, you know, the boy is already born. They're not there in able to take the action and kill. And that's one of the reasons why Pharaoh then needs to change his policy. So it, it, one might say that it was not, it, it's effective in saving lives, but it's, it's, you know, it, didn't, it didn't end the policy of annihilation. But Pharaoh has to change his policy because of the direct inaction, the disobedience of the midwives. They refused to do a something that they were instructed to do. Another key case that we have is the, uh, is the case of um, the priests of Nov. And Shaul has Ahimelech killed and then also wants to kill the priests around him. 
and he turns to his guards who are with him and he says slay the priests of the Lord because they're also siding with David this is the period where David not yet king is um, is fleeing from Saul Samuel has made it clear to Saul that he is going to lose the throne and there's there's a civil war within Israel so turn and slay the priests of the Lord and uh, because they side with David and his servants refuse to kill the priests um, so he then turns to Doeg and tells him to do so and Doeg goes ahead and does it so the we have the servants refusing to take the action which they believe to be either immoral or possibly just not in their long-term interests if they know that um, David ultimately will be victorious. One of the most famous cases of, the, uh, of, of disobedience, and it's slightly different, is the case of, um, of Daniel who finds himself thrown into the lion's den. So Daniel is a servant of the king in Babylon, is one of his high ministers. And uh, he is popular with the king, but he is unpopular with the locals who don't like to see a Jew in high office. They look to undermine him and want to see him destroyed. So they conspire. And they say, we'll not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him in the matter of the law of his God. And they realize that in every respect, Daniel is somebody who abides by the local commands of the king. And the only way they're going to manage to unseat him is if they can create a tension between the Dina de Malchuta, the law of the state or of the king, and the law of God. So they come up with a plan where, um, that, where they consult with the king and he should establish a statute and make a strong interdict that whoever should ask petition of any god or man for 30 days, accepting the king, should be cast into a den of lions. And you can, you know, people can do what they like, but if they're going to doven, they have to doven to the king. And Daniel Here's what's happening. And he goes into his house, and it says, Now his windows were open in his upper chamber towards Yerushalayim, and he knelt on his knees three times a day, and he prayed, and he gave thanks before his God, as he used to do. And the people come, and they find him making petition and supplication, and they come to the king, and they say, Have you not signed an interdict that every man shall make who makes a petition except to the king shall be cast into a den of lions? And the king says, This is true. And then after that, they bring Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. And you can see the king speaks and says to Daniel, Your God who you serve continually, he will deliver you. So, so what... You know, what is the king's attitude in all of this? He's going to die. <laughs> do, do, you think, do you think the king is taunting Daniel? No, I don't think so. No, I think he's expressing uh, confidence that all would be well. Confidence or hope, yes. I, yes. You know, we, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't bank on miracles. But we don't get any idea here that the king is hostile to no. um, is, is, is hostile to Daniel. Um, there, there, there clearly had been a good relationship, and Daniel yeah. has been set up here. Um, I'll tell you. But it's a little bit like a Greek tragedy playing oh, itself. Yeah, I'm looking the fridge in the drawers. Brian, I'm muting you because you've got noise in the background there. Um, there's, it's a bit like a tragedy playing itself out. The king feels he has to do what he has signed himself to do. And he throws, um, he throws Daniel into the lion's den. He doesn't, he doesn't take the lions out. It's not like the, uh, um, he doesn't say that the Jewish community can come and arm themselves against the lions. So it's a little bit different from Ahasuerus. But, you know, the king, the God, your God, your God, who you continually serve, he recognizes, not my God, I mean, in, 
you know, as far as people locally concerned, he was a god. Um, so they throw him into the lion's den and they seal it. And the king goes to his palace, passes the night fasting. Right? The king is genuinely upset as what's happened. Then the king gets up very early in the morning and goes in haste to the den of lions. He wants to see what's happened. And when he comes near to the, uh, to the den to Daniel, he cried with a pained voice. The king sp spoke and says to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God, uh, uh, oh Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God who you serve continually able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel says to the king, O king, live forever. Now, there are two ways of reading what's happening here. Um, who is Daniel addressing as O king? God. It appears as though he's talking to the person who has just to spoken to him, who is the king. I think Daniel's addressing God. <clears throat> Why do you think Daniel's addressing God? Because God saved him. He was in a very dire situation. And if the king wishes to think he's addressing him, that's fine. But Daniel knows who he's addressing. Right. He's addressing both. He's addressing both. Why? Well, I think um, in his heart, he is addressing in, in one direction and, and he's also addressing the king. Right. Hey, so does it bother... Go on, Barry Zakon. Uh, it, it's a pointless thing to say to, to God Almighty, live forever. It's, mm. it's a meaningless expression. Yeah. So he, must be, he must be speaking to the king. Well, we say Hashem, you know, Hashem Melach, Hashem Malach, Hashem Yimloch, Lolam Vaed. So we, we, we definitely, we definitely say it not necessarily to God, but we say it as an expression. Okay. Um, why, even if it isn't addressed to the king, and, and, and I think it is addressed to the king, I mean, but even if it isn't addressed to the king, what is the impression that is being given to the king? He isn't complaining about what the king did to him. Right. Maybe he's saying thanks for asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for asking. Can I have some chips? Um, um, no, he's, ex he's expressing his loyalty to the king, and he's also annoyed that he is being betrayed. I, I, I get the loyalty to the king, Joshua. Where's, where's the annoyance at betrayal in that? Well... Uh, I've done everything to keep my my side of it, and you're not keeping your side of it somehow to protect your citizens. Your, I'm I'm a I'm a lawful. I, I I abide by the laws of this of 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 your your decrees, but um, I am being now having to pay for this. But where does it say that? Well, it's not said in that way. It's just he is actually saying it in defiance, in a in a sort of there is a certain defiance here to the king in a, in a, in a passive, passive way. Right. Has, 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 no, I don't know. Um, um, surely this is nothing different from long live our noble queen. He's, he's survived the night. Um, he basically wants to make his peace with the king, even though he's effectively proved that, 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 that a college protocol has saved him. So he's basically showing his loyalty to the crown. Surely that's nothing more than that. I, 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 side with, uh, I side with what Brian is saying here. I think it is, I think it's it's addressed, it, I think it's addressed to the king. Um, and it's, it's completely unashamed. It is a public affirmation of the, uh, uh, of the king. I mean, unless you say that the king and Daniel and any people there. But, but he's not saying, you know, I'm worried that word is going to get out that I'm siding with your majesty. He's not saying I'm in defiance of your majesty. He's accepting the authority of the king, even with everything that's happened. What is the difference between this case and the two before? Just reminding you, the two before were the midwives and the, uh, um, and, and the, the failure of Saul's uh, men to kill the priests of Nod. What's the difference between Daniel and his refusing and the, um, and the previous cases? Now his was passive resistance. Theirs was active actions. 
Go on. Irene, I think you're absolutely right and wrong at the same time. Sorry? I think you're absolutely right and wrong at the same time. Who's is oh. <laughs> Um, I think, well, I, I don't know which bit you think was wrong, so I don't want to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so the midwives do not kill. And yes. the men of Saul do not kill, whereas Daniel actively davens and has his window open and kneels and davens in a very public way. He doesn't, he doesn't hide what he's doing. So the midwives conceal what has happened. They tell a story. Yeah. I mean, they refuse to kill, but they say, you know, they have this bubermeister about all the, uh, you know, the, the, the births being uh, so rapid that we can't get there. Um, they don't say it is immoral. Um, and we don't know what the morality of Saul's men are. But we do know here that Daniel is completely overt in, 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 in what he does, um, in, in his taking a stance against the, uh, against the king. So there are some you know, great cases of, um, of rebellion or failing to listen to authority that we get in the Torah and beyond it. So in the apocryphal work, in the book of the Maccabees, and the Maccabees and their stories are not written substantially in, uh, you know, in the Talmud or any of our sources. It's one of the Torah the outside books, the apocrypha. Um, so the Christians put it within our literature. Um, and partly it's because of the huge civil war and the fact that there was tremendous corruption in Israel in its day. Um, and, uh, and a huge loss of spirituality. It's just not one of the holy books, according to our canon. Um, but it says, many were resolved to, in their heart, not to eat unclean food. They preferred to die rather than be defiled and break the holy covenant, and they did die. People chose martyrdom rather than, this is before the Talmud had come up with, with the laws that we apply today, um, the, uh, they, they preferred to die rather than eat chaza. Um, Ma Matityahu says, and this is where we get the, uh, you know, those who will keep the covenant follow me. I, I, my brothers walk in the covenant of our fathers. We will not listen to the decrees of the king by going astray from our worship. You know, we've got one Lord and we're going to follow him either to the right or to the left. Let everyone who is zealous for the law, any of the Kanaim, should maintain the covenant and they should disobey the law of the land. Um, and they take, it tells the story of women being hurled from the city wall, holding their children because they violated the law um, prohibiting Brit Milah. And men who had secretly observed the Shabbat in caves were burned alive. I make no comment about illegal garden minyanim um, and ones which don't comply with the legal requirements. Clearly some do comply with legal requirements. But people secretly observed Shabbat in caves and they were burnt alive. So people chose to violate the law because Hashem's law was more important to them than, um, than the instructions which were there to destroy Judaism. Um, one of the most famous stories, and I'm not going to read it all, is the martyrdom of Eliezer, um, who is a scribe, and they put him to the rack. Um, and he refuses, he refuses to recount. And in fact, they offer him non-kosher food. And he says, um, and, 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 and they say to him, you know, pretend it's kosher food, bring it from your own home. Um, and um, then they even say to him, take kosher food from your own home. Just let us have the victory that it looks like you're eating treif. And he refuses to even look as if he's eating treif, even though he would be eating kosher. And eventually they torture him to death. Um, and he dies on, in the Book of Maccabees on the rack. Um, but, because he's not allowed to do that halakhically. Well, yeah, so... So we, we, we will get to that. We will get to that. Uh, it, it might be that, uh, you know, he, well, uh, we'll get to it now. Um, if you're violating something in public that looks as if you are changing even the custom of the way you tie your sandals, says Rambam in Hilchot um, uh, Malachim. 
Um, if it looks like, if you're, you're or in Hilchot of Zara, if the powers that be are trying to humiliate your religious principle, even on the slightest principle in public, you need to die. Um, if it was in private, then 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 not. Um, but uh, um, he chooses death. We have the famous story of Hannah and her sons, and she she says uh, this is you know beautiful beautiful um, lines. Um, we're ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our ancestors. And just before the seventh one is killed, I do not know how you came into being in my womb, she says to him. It was not I who gave you life and breath, nor I who set in order the elements within each of you. Therefore, the creator of the world who shaped the beginning of humankind and devised the origin of all things will in his mercy give life and breath back to you again, since you now forget yourselves for the sake of his laws. Um, you know, there's a sense of, of priority. One famous case, um, which is documented by both Josephus and Philo, is the Jewish world come to Petronius, um, one of the Roman governors, um, who is supposed to bring a statue into the temple and have everybody bow down at it. Um, and they come in their minds and say, we cannot, we cannot bow down. While we're alive, we cannot permit such things as are forbidden by our law. And Petronius is angry and says, Caesar has sent me. I am compelled to observe his decrees. Orders are orders. I'm just following orders. The Jews replied, since you are so disposed, O Petronius, that you will not disobey Caesar's orders, neither will we transgress the commands of our law. Orders are orders. So Petronius sees by their words that their determination was hard to be removed. He couldn't, uh, th th that he would not be able to follow what Caligula, as the emperor at the time says, in the dedication of his statue. Um, and so he comes to them and says, will you make war with Caesar, regardless of his great preparations for war? You're absolute mashuganers. How few are you and how many are he? You're a bunch of Jews. You can't, you, you know, you, you can't put anything together other than a Talmud share. Um, he's got, he's got the legions that will attract, uh, that'll, uh, you know, take over Europe. They say, we will not by any means make war with Caesar, but we will die before we see our laws transgressed. Um, we're not making war. We are disobeying because we are following another law, which is our principle. And they throw themselves down on their faces, stretched out their throats so they were ready to be slain. And they did it for 40 days, neglecting to till their soil, though this was the system that called for sowing. You know, they're, they're going to lose their lives. What does it matter? Um, they are showing their absolute readiness to do this. So Petronius listens to the petitioners, calls them together in Tiberius. They come tens of thousands of them. He says, um, I don't think it just to have such a regard to my own safety and honor as to refuse to sacrifice them for your per uh, preservation, who are so many in number, and you endeavor to preserve the regard that is due to your law. I will send to Caligula and let him know your resolutions. I will assist your cause as far as I am able, so that you may not suffer on account of your honest designs. May God assist you. But... If Caligula should be angry and turn the violence of his rage on me, I would rather undergo that danger and affliction on my body or soul than see so many of you perish. Right? The Roman governor is so moved by what he sees that, I don't know what you say, he takes the knee. He, he just refuses to, uh, he, ref he, he refuses to do what he was instructed to do and writes back to the emperor saying, this is the position I'm going to do. And he writes to Caligula to entreat him not to drive so many tens of thousands to distraction, that if he were to slay these men, he would be publicly cursed for all future ages. He recognizes that there is a moral consequence for what he does. And Philo um, writes, writes the same. We're evacuating our cities, withdrawing from our houses and our lands, etc. If we cannot persuade you, we give up ourselves for destruction. We don't want to live to see a calamity worse than death. So there are some key principles that come out of this. These are, these are the stories. We're not interested just in, in stories. Um, we're interested in the, uh, you know, what we learn from them about dispute and, and, and conflict today. So first of all, there needs to be a, a law. Secondly, those who are commanded to obey the law 
have made a determination that it is unconscionable. It's just not an appropriate law to follow. Third, they refuse to obey it. Um, and in the case of Daniel, they take an active step of disobedience in refusing to obey it. They resist in a non-violent manner. Um, and they're prepared to put their lives on the line or suffer for their conscience. They don't run and hide. Um, they don't say, by what right are you doing this? Uh, they're, they're prepared to say, you have to do what you have to do, but by yeah. the same token, we have to do what we have to do. Yeah. Um, we are bound by our spiritual obligation. Um, and with, with the case of the Josephus, but the Petronius case, I, they try to use reconciliation by argument. I, this, is, this is a campaign not just for their lives and their, I, I, and, 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 and their values, but actually there is a statement to be made and they want to win over the other person. And they discuss with Petronius. They don't, uh, they don't try and overwhelm Petronius. Um, we have dialogue leading to diplomacy, leading to change. Um, you know, what we we're just looking at the, uh, the, the, the disobedience before, um, Darius, Darvesh does not say, I've got higher authorities than my own laws. Clearly, I was tricked and made a mistake and what I'm going to do now when I throw Daniel into the lion's den is manifestly unjust. You know, he doesn't back off. He knows he's doing a wrong thing. He feels bad about it. He goes and sees Daniel. He feels bad about it. But, uh, but he is not somebody prepared to take the moral high ground, whereas Daniel is somebody who is prepared to take the moral high ground. So the question is, you know, how far do you need to go? in uh, a, a, and for what do you need to lay down your life and we know from the Gemara in Sanhedrin that um, that you know it, there are only three things that we are required to lay down our lives for and those are idolatry incest and murder so eating treif to save your life is absolutely um, permissible if you know, in, in, in sort of normative circumstances. And these principles were distilled during the time of the Romans. They, you know, the logic is drawn out. That's not to say that Torah uh, Shemayim and the principles by which we operate don't come from Sinai, but the rules as formulated are part of what is said at the, uh, you know, at the time of the, uh, of the Talmud, and it's a response to what's happening in the Roman experience, and the stories that are set around it are set around the Roman experience. Um, and it says just these three things, but if you look at Rambam later um, and other codices, it says this applies when it is a personal matter and they are just trying to oppress you. There is a difference when they are trying to oppress the entirety of Judaism and squash it, at which point when, if somebody was to say, well, you know, I'm gonna pick on the most niggling little detail of what Jews do and just make them violate it, because I just wanna make the Jews do something wrong. You know, I'm not gonna make them, I'm not gonna make them, uh, uh, do something that is, you know, eat pork or worship an idol. I want them to change the minhag of how they do something insignificant, like which order they put their shoes on and how they lace their shoes. I make them change a minhag because I want to make the Jews have spiritual I've things. If, I've that had that. if that happens, according to Rambam, what you need to do is, 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 is martyr them because this is an assault on Judaism not the Jews. That's a distinction that found itself played out with huge discord when it came to um, oppression of the Jews in the ghettos. Um, and Rav Oshri and others eventually needed to rule that there is a distinction between the localized humiliation of Judaism, which requires mass sacrifice, and the absolute destruction of Judaism, 
which required many changes in order to keep Jews and some form of Judaism alive, even if they were going to be compromising on principles. So uh, the, the, the idea of you know, how flexible we are is something which is constantly, uh, constantly revisited. How do we know? How do we know what are the areas that we stand up to or against? So we have an idea that, 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 that there, is a, there is a conscience. Um, there are things that we know are wrong. You know, it's not distant from you. It's just so hard to do the commandments. You know what's right. Um, they should be bound onto your fingers as to fill him. You shall write them on the tablet of your heart. Now, uh, that is one of the sort of anti, uh, an, an, an anti-Karite approaches, because it's very difficult to do that um, in reality. What it says is, in your heart, in your heart of hearts, you know what is right and wrong, and you shouldn't be... You shouldn't be, um, you shouldn't be violating the things which you know are morally wrong. I will put my law in their inward parts. I will put it, Natati et Torati Bam, Bam, and on their hearts. I mean, there's an understanding that the law is in our hearts. Hey, how do we know that? How do we know that these verses are not to be taken just as some sort of airy fairy bubbly metaphor? Um, you will do the halachas, and your hearts will change. How do we know that God really expects us to exercise? Seichel and discretion and conscience. When I ask questions, suddenly everybody's mute. <laughs> How do we know? How do we know? Well, I came and I Cain and Abel. And you will remember the story from the beginning of the Bible. Um, God, God challenges Cain about what he has done and assumes that Cain will realize that you are not supposed to kill your brother. Um, um, the punishment at the time of the flood, there are no mitzvahs before the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach that anybody says are written down or supposed to be followed. I mean, we understand that you're not supposed to have a, an environment of Hamas, of bloodshed and, and lust. Um, the destruction of Sodom and Amorah, which, which Avram objects to on moral grounds, is, for pun is a punishment for an immorality, Hashem assumes a core moral code that people understand is right. Even the Egyptian midwives knew that something is right. So the framing of the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach, and interestingly, it's only three of them that we need to die for. Um, but the framing of the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach is an articulation of a natural law that we believe already exists. And we have a responsibility, and all of humanity has a responsibility to respect that moral code um, and to refuse to violate that moral code, even if it is going to entail punishment. Nothing I've said at the moment addresses insurrection and the time of Petronius they didn't say we're going to declare war against Caesar and maybe because that would have been an absolute folly but it's we recognize that we will not do what is wrong for us and we will suffer the consequence if it is if it is inappropriate if you know it, uh, but we will accept the authority we'll accept the authority of the legislator even if we believe that the laws are wrong. So that's where we're at up to this point. There's a lovely, 
um, a lovely Sforno, which is which is overlooked unless you're studying the Sforno, because I don't think anybody else particularly addresses it um, in the uh, early Moshe story. So it says, "Vetered bat paro lirchotz al hayor." Pharaoh's daughter goes down to wash at the Nile. Vanaratacha holchot al yad hayor, and her girls come with her up to the banks of the river. Vetera et hateva. And she sees the ark, the, 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 the basket in which Moses is, in the reeds, and she sends her girl to get it. So there are different ways of parsing what happens here. But what the Sephorno draws out is the idea. She, see, she goes down to bathe, and she's there with her maids. Who are her maids? They're the servants, the friends, the people who are her general entourage. And that's why you've got Naroteha here. Selecting, selecting that. It's got Naroteha there in the plural. But when it comes to the, um, when it comes to picking up the basket, Vitishlach et Amata, she's got a singular girl or maid servant. So. What Sforno says is, you know, you go down to the river with your own <coughs> dog, but when you're coming to get to, to bathe, you don't take everybody into the water with you. They're going to be around on the banks and somewhere just a little bit different, distant. And you're going to go into the water with just your private maidservant. Um, and so she is with just the one person who she sends to pick up the basket. Now, we pause it either she goes down to the river to, to, to the river um, and she sees her basket amongst the reeds, reeds while she is with her maidens or perhaps when it's only when she's alone with her handmaid that she sees the uh, that she sees the uh, basket but the way the Sephorno reads it is that you know the maid servant is her private servant who waits with her while she's washing um, she, she, she doesn't want any of this to happen in the presence of her wider entourage. Because if she was with the wider court and her entourage, they would have insisted that the, um, that the basket be thrown back into the river. So she knows it's one of the Hebrews, and she is prepared to take, this obliga take the onus on her privately. She doesn't want to get into a discussion on the rights and wrongs of what's happening with the people who might be, uh, might be less disposed to Israelite babies. We, I said you need to accept the authority of the law, um, even if you don't like it, um, in terms of everything that we've seen so far. So Rambam and Hilchot Malachim in the, uh, um, in the, I think it's the third parak, yeah, the third parak says, anyone who rebels against the king of Israel may be executed by the king, even if the king's order is one of his, even if the king order one of his people to go to a particular place and the latter refuses or he orders him not to leave his house and he goes out, the offender is liable to be put to death. These are just, you know, a curfew, lockdown, and the king may execute him if he desires. Um, similarly, anyone who embarrasses or shames the king may be executed, as was Shemit ben Gera. So here it's so the king makes just a, a, a command on what you may or may not do, and you're supposed to do it. And you are not allowed to. Uh, you're not allowed to say, "Well, you know, I, you know there, was a, there was there was an instruction that there was an instruction that I needed to be locked down in London, but I, I really felt the need to have my eyes tested in Durham, and so I drove up there to do it." You know, you, know, you, you have to do what the king says. Anybody who rebels against it, put to death. I mean, shaming the king, called the and just jumping to 10, a murderer against whom evidence is not totally conclusive or was not warned before he slew his victim, or even one who observed only by one witness, and similarly an enemy who had inadvertently killed one of his foes, the king has license to execute him and to improve society. And we, as a matter of halacha, 
I mean, we don't look to the two witnesses. We don't look to the trial that is set out in Hilchot Sanhedrin, the compassion that we have for lives and dignity. Hey, I mean, listen how far Rambam takes this. He may execute many on one day, hang them and leave them hanging for many days in order to cast fear into the hearts and destroy the power of the wicked on earth. Right? What Rambam, happened to the rule of law? Well, no, so, so, so we have the halachic rule of law that is supposed to be applied by the Sanhedrin. And then we, ex we accept the idea that the king's authority extends to potential abusive power. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it's extensive. I and mean, this is clearly what happened. You had a tension in Israel between what the priests, the rabbis, the Sanhedrin wanted, and the priests and the rabbis and the Sanhedrin possibly have had a measure of corruption amongst them as well, and what the king wanted um, at the time when there was a king. So a murder, a, a person who negated a king's command, jumping back to number nine, because he was occupied with a mitzvah, even a minor one is not liable. So testing your eyes a mit is not a mitzvah. On the other hand, protecting your young son may be a mitzvah. Whose word should have, sorry, that is, that is dragon dictate letting me down. Whose word should have precedence? This is nothing to do with, <laughs> this is nothing to do with debt old Trump. Um, <laughs> whose words should have precedence in case of conflict? The words of the master or the words of the subject? Needless to say, if a king decrees that a mitzvah should be negated, his words should not be heeded. So we have, number one, an understanding that there is a natural conscience and morality. We have an obligation to listen to that. Number two, and, 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 and to suffer the consequences. Number two, we have an absolute requirement not to violate Torah law and must suffer consequences. And it comes to, uh, you know, we can compromise on certain things, but at a point where the Torah itself is under threat, or we're taking a life, or doing an immoral act, or worshipping an idol, 100% there is an obligation to be a martyr. But by and large, we should not be martyrs. It's wrong to martyr ourselves, as Brian pointed out before, it's wrong to martyr ourselves for something which is unnecessary. I mean, a celebrated um, case of Rambam, in his letters to the Jews of Yemen, when they were asked about conversion um, uh, to Islam, and he wrote back and said, Islam is not idolatrous. You can convert to Islam on the basis that they know you're not converting, and you know you're not converting, and it's all a matter of show. And they come back and say, yes, but lots of our people martyred themselves rather than convert to Islam if we don't convert. <laughs> in vain. And Rambam says, anybody who converts yeah, yeah. to Islam, uh, who refuses to convert to Islam, when they know that you're not converting and you know you're not converting, anybody who refuses to do it um, is liable to the death penalty um, and everybody who's died already should be treated as and respected as a martyr. But you know, this is the position. You're not supposed to die unnecessarily. Um, however, however, there is an obligation to stand up against things which are um, egregious and wrong. We have many instances of defiance even within halakha. Um, the zaken mamre, the person who teaches according to a tradition which is found within logic within halakha, appropriately formulated, but is a minority opinion. And that person is allowed to retain his intellectual integrity and he's allowed to teach what he believes to be right as long as he it with the integrity of saying, I am in the minority and the halacha has ruled the other way. But this is the way I see it. And if he refuses to do that, then he's taken out and put to death. And one of the people who was excommunicated um, for teaching against the mainstream practice was a Kavya ben Mahalalel, who is an outstanding scholar. And uh, his uh, he, he, stories about him exist um, throughout throughout the Gemara and in the Mishnah in Edu Yot. It says he, was, he admonished his son to submit to the views of the majority. He's lying, dying, and he tells his son, "You need to follow what they are teaching, not what I've brought you up to do all your life, even where I have opposed what they are doing." His son says, "This is inconsistent," and he says. I've received my tradition from a majority, uh, 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 from a majority of a school in my days, and so have many opponents. 
I was bound to conform to the tradition I had received. I was raised this way. I was brought up this way. This was my minhag. This is my teaching. Um, and I have held to it because I believe it is right. I was bound to conform to the tradition I'd received. And the others, they are bound by their tradition. You, you've heard my tradition and you've heard their tradition. And given that you've heard both, and you know that mine is the minority, you have an obligation to follow theirs, which is the majority, and negate mine. So even though he held by his own tradition, he was prepared to say on his dying breath, with his dying breaths, that his son needed to follow the right or the orthodox understanding of what needs to happen. So it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult source in terms of minimum, but it's, it shows that there needs to be respect for authority and even the rebels are supposed to respect authority. Um, um, we have the very famous story as I watch of the cathedral be uh, behind me um, of the of the um, Tanur Achnai, the oven in which the sages were arguing about how it needed to be operated on Shabbat, and all but one sage says it needs to be done this way, and Elazar ben Azaria says no, it needs to be done this way, and they say you're wrong, and he says uh, um, we're going to make the carob tree move. And uh, to prove I'm right, and the carob tree moves, and they say we don't take suck from a carob tree, the river will run backwards. And they say we don't want to take suck from a river, even though it runs backwards. God's voice will call out, there will be a butt call to support me. And God calls out, you know, the halacha is like Elazar ben Azariah in this case. And, uh, and uh, just before that happens, there is the, because of the archers behind me, he, he says the walls of the Bet Midrash will come crashing down to prove that I'm right. And the walls of the Bet Midrash start coming down. And they say, we don't take the halacha from the walls of a Bet Midrash. We don't take the halacha from, from the word of God. It says, Lava Shamayim He, it's done by a majority. We are the sages. We say the walls, the, you know, the, the, the walls stopped falling, but they stayed just a little bit bent. You know, we follow the majority, we follow the process. We accept that right opinions are not necessarily the majority opinion, and sometimes the majority opinion in halacha prevails, even though God clearly wanted it the other way, because it has been given to us to handle. And within that is a very important message about managing communities. I mean, the numbers and popular feeling matters too. I mean, the democratic opinion matters too. Not to the exclusion of God and not to deny God, but within godly parameters, we listen to what people are feeling and saying and how they are reacting. And therefore, when a crowd of people say that something is wrong, we're supposed to reason with them. We're supposed to be like Petronius. We're supposed to consider what is happening. And even if we've got orders and traditions and history lying down behind us, and we've got our principles, and we're raised with our principles, just like Akavia ben Mahalalel was raised with his principles, we need to listen to what is happening in the street and the feeling around. The majority are sometimes the people in power, the majority are sometimes the people in the streets, but we need to listen to genuine cries of conscience. The people genuinely crying with conscience, if they're going to disobey, if they're going to depart from normative behavior, at the same time, to respect the idea of authority, respect the idea of law, and respect the fact that they might well be punished for the violation of law. So I want to come to rage just uh, as a final idea, and, uh, and Pinchas. You know, Pinchas is somebody who was outraged and took the law into his own hands. And we have a, uh, you know, the famous story, he sees people behaving in an immoral way in front of the, uh, in front of the Mishkan, and he takes his spear and he throws it and kills them. And it's presented as an extrajudicial killing. And nonetheless, Pinchas is promoted to a priest and at the beginning of the following Parsha, which is the one named after him, he's given by God, Bruti Shalom, a covenant of peace. People ask, how could Pinchas do such a thing? I mean, isn't there due process? So within the Gomorrah in Sanhedrin 82b, 
um, we see a deconstruction or a reconstruction of the story where it says that, you know, Vayar Pinchas, Pinchas, the son of Elazar, son of Aaron, saw and he gets up from amidst the congregation and took a spear in his hand. So what does he see? He sees the incident taking place and he remembers the halacha and he says to Moshe, brother of the father of my father, uh, didn't you teach me during your descent from Mount Sinai, one who ascend, uh, engages in immoral behavior um, should be put to death. And Moshe says to him, let the one who reads the letter be the agent. You're the person who remembered the halacha. You're the person who should, um, uh, who should execute judgment. What is the fundamental difference between that narrative and the one that we read at the end of Parshat Balak? No. Well, he's doing it in accordance with the law. So not not only is he doing, so number one, he's doing it in accordance with the law. It's not it's not just an act of rage. It isn't just he sees something that he says this has no place. I'm going to take the uh, I'm going to take my spear and throw it, throw it at people because I'm angry. He says it, it, it it's it's a judicial killing. Um, he asks Moshe. Um, so the, the, uh, he, he gets sanction to do something. He's now executing judgment of the Beth Din in what he is doing, according to the presentation. And in fact, you know, the Gemara says he rose from amidst the assembly. You know, what is the assembly? The assembly is the Sanhedrin. It's the gathering of elders. You know, he's, not, he's not coming out of the crowd, picking up a spear and throwing it. I mean, this is happening outside. He goes to the assembly and says, this is happening outside. He gets up from the assembly because they won't come to agreement. And then he goes to Moshe. And Moshe says, yeah, you're right. This is the halacha. Go do what needs to be done. So the Gomorrah here completely reworks the story from an act of outrage and anger into something that is... Um, that is um, done judicially and with consultation. I, of course, of course, the way it's presented in the Torah is the opposite. And what we have here is the rabbis trying to, with the words, create the scenario of something that is not passion and rage. No idea what actually happened and how it actually happened. The rabbis are doing this for a reason. The rabbis don't want things to happen through passion and rage. They want consultation to change minds. Um, and Pinchas was right. He was blessed by God and given the priesthood. But perhaps, perhaps there's a right way to do it. And the way that the Talmud here wants us to approach it is the right way. Not by taking direct action, not by acting in anger, it's by saying we need to do the right thing the right way. I mean, to my mind, it is unconscionable that slavers should be praised and lauded for what they have done. Um, I mean, many people are conquerors and have done good things and bad things. I and mean, Francis Drake was a gallant navigator, even if he was somebody who was responsible for um, you know, for, for, for starting the slave trade. Walter Raleigh, certainly, you know, the first, the first true gentleman in putting his uh, cloak down for the Queen, even if he was just a little bit of a pirate. Um, <laughs> you know, we've got, we've got, you know, Robin Hood, the story is just far too good to ignore him. Oliver Cromwell, you know, I do feel, and Chris Patton mentioned it on the radio today, I, I do feel for those Irish people um, who exactly. walked into Parliament and passed exactly. his statue, and every time we go in there, it's through the Cromwell Gate. You know what he did was what he did was savage. He was a very good man in some respects, a terrible man in others, absolutely terrible. And you know, even after his own death, his own people, England saw him as as something of a tyrant, um, and 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 he was not celebrated. Um, Simon de Montfort, the father of the British Parliament. 
um, which is the mother of all parliaments, was one of the most outrageous anti-Semite and responsible for the total butchery of the Jewish community uh, yeah. until he was savaged himself by people who, um, who resisted him. So we come from people with complex pasts. And for people who do to this day feel the pain, to make them endure those statues, I think is wrong. I mean, to celebrate those people is wrong. If somebody were to say oh, that Hitler was a great, Hitler was a great uh, you know, he, he, was a, he, he was great for the car industry and they wanted to put up a statue for him outside <laughs> the factory, I wouldn't, I, you know, totally wrong. But where's well, the exist we have the, you have the Taliban as well with the, oh, with so the, the pu pulling down the Palmyra and things like that. I that's I spoke that that's one of the things I reference when I spoke that's about vandalism. Hey, that's that's uh, vandalism. That's egregious vandalism. Um, and I think to I think to dis destroy ecclesia and synagogue outside churches would be vandalism. I'd much rather people had their attention drawn to it and say how far we have come from this point, what we have learned from now. I think there's a right way of handling, there's exactly. a right way of handling the situation. But to dismiss the passion is wrong. Um, and to ignore the good that people have done just because they have done some really bad things is also wrong. I mean, how we balance it, that's difficult. And the dialogue is important. What we have here in... Oh. Rabbi Lawrence, yes. this has come out. Of, this this has come out of a context which is this police brutality, or in in America, and this has it created the the current uh, tensions and has brought these issues to light. They're not really, um, and, and and the Black uh, Lives Matter movement have harvested the emotions to 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 create a, a, a situation what they want to see. It's a political, largely political, um, really driven ma um, action. That's fundamentally what's wrong with it. Sorry, can I just say, I'm probably the only person in, in the room at the moment who has a conviction for civil disobedience. And I would do it again. Um, I sat down in the middle of, uh, of the road outside an American air base because of um, the Committee of 100 against, uh, in, in favour of unilateral disarmament. But I would not have pulled down the statue in that way. I would have, uh, that is against the law, it's vandalism. The statue should come down, it should go into a museum as a warning against man's inhumanity to man. But I don't think that That's sort true. of action is helpful. Uh, I was just merely putting the context as to why this happened at this particular yes. point. So, 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 so Joshua, I'm prepared to say, you know, it, it's absolutely true that the, uh, that the George Floyd episode has been a trigger for something now. On the other hand, the opposition to some of these statues um, it is something which, is, which, which goes back for many years. And yes. statues that were put up in Charlottesville and other places were done deliberately and at a certain point where not only had the South recovered enough from the uh, expenses of war to put up these statues, but it was completely funded by people on the, uh, on, 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 on the white right. Um, and so some of the statues that are of historic and gallant generals are very, very much put up by the people who have a nostalgia for a slaving South. Yeah. Um, and, that is, and, and that is what is understood. And the statistics of police brutality against the Blacks um, and the likelihood Rabbi of- Rabbi Lawrence, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's not, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying that the, way, the timing and the methods and the way people have responded and how they have acted in the way they have has is 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 created by um, has been has, if you like it's been harvested for for this um, for for yeah. their own political yeah. ends. And there's a bunch is, of anarchists, which there's a bunch have, of anarchists have, who are seizing on this, as there was with the with the gilets jaunes, and the anonymous. Um, yeah. th 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 there are a lot of people trying to t trying to uh, um, get in on the act. Can yes. I ask you a question? 
Rabbi Lawrence, can, um, I, I mean, the Coulston and, and Rhodes and people like that, uh, can they redeem themselves by doing good deeds with the money that they got from slavery? I, I'm not able to answer for anyone's ability to do tshuva. Um, I think we believe that there is the opportunity to do tshuva. It's not clear that they were trying to redeem themselves. It's quite possible that they were both philanthropic and uh, and and, and uh, people who who were slavers. So yeah. you, you, we, we don't necessarily need to jump to that that conclusion. Um, I, let let everyone let everyone who objects to um, to the Rhodes Fellowship refuse to watch sport and other things funded by gambling or, uh, yeah. or tobacco. Yeah. Um, you know, let let's you know let, let let's be consistent if we have to be in that. Um, and and we're not. You know, we we pick and choose, or people seem to pick and choose. Uh, I think there is tremendous inequity. Um, that is being done by the uh, by sports organizations in gambling, people involved in yes. alcohol, people involved in tobacco, um, mm -hmm. people who employ those on zero hours contracts, people who are responsible for deforestation and exploitation of resources and communities around the world. Uh, yes. There is a slave industry that exists today, which bothers me a lot more uh, than worrying about a statue for a slaver in the past. That's not to say that the wrongs of the past don't have a um, consequence in the present, and I am concerned about those. I'm also minded that it's been difficult to speak out on Black Lives Matter for some of us, because at the same time as agreeing with the oh, slogan absolutely. Black Lives Matter, they support BDS and, uh, and yeah. the dismantling of Israel. It's not just the yeah. police, it's the people who are yeah. dismantled. So, um, so, so slogans and ideas become hugely politicized and force us to walk very, very difficult tightropes. Um, the chief rabbi, I was, I was actually surprised, had used Black Lives Matter in his tweet, um, and it was probably appropriate for the time. And the, uh, and, and the sentiment is very, very good. But the politics of some of the people around it, as Joshua said, with the, with the timing and why this is happening now. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of other people's baggage that is being brought into the story. But the that's, that, that's the problem, the, the baggage. <laughs> that's being brought into it. And, and, and the fact is that everyone seeks to gain power. Uh, they're using it, uh, they're using it for, for, to, to uh, establish power, which is not necessarily connected with the causes that they uh, uh, stand for, or they say they stand for. So the fact is, for example, if Black Lives Matter they are in, in, in keen to keep keep to that uh, particular slogan. Then they would look at well, what's happening in Nigeria? What's happening in Libya? What's happening in um, across the Middle East with slavery? They don't come out in that way. They tend to sort of only focus on uh, Donald Trump, on <laughs> Boris Johnson, on the on the statues. Uh, and, and essentially, this this country is is a tolerant country and has quite a lot of uh, good things to say about it and, and it has laws that do, do protect civil rights of, 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 of people. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a far distant cry from some of those other places and yet Black Lives Matter tends to sort of come in on this side very much faster than um, looking at the other issues and that, that's, what's that's what troubles me that there is a political that's agenda a, behind all this. What about that's uh, called uh, what aboutery. What aboutery is is quite um, uh, un un it's useless because you have to look at things that are wrong, and it doesn't matter that there's something wrong elsewhere. When people when we com uh, complained about a party, people you say, oh, "What about this?" and then, "What aboutery doesn't work." You have to well, apart well, ap well apartheid is is, <laughs> is very much a, a black issue and um the fact is that this is uh this is where it's it's all it comes from i mean it's it is that uh, racism against black people um and the fact is that this is it, it is a it's a serious problem when i see a movement just standing in in a in, uh, very selectively and directing its way th through it of course and it's also 
uh, co-opted, uh, as uh, Rabbi Lawrence said, the uh, Palestinian causes uh, as as, a, as another another victim thinks that only to hit on Jews at this point. It is very troubling when that kind of thing um, happens. Um, there shouldn't be a, shouldn't that shouldn't be there. Most people who are ra anti-racist, and I am certainly uh, anti-racist, um, very careful with what uh, I, I in the work I in the areas of work I do and with the people I deal with. Um, that that I'm sort of double check myself that I'm not sort of saying or saying things against people. It's that's been been my education. Uh, this way I've been brought up to think and so on sensitively about others uh, so I, I think we're all in this room agreeing on that point but the um the the, the real problem is how it gets politicized and it, and i and, and that troubles me the, the 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 way we are all becoming very divided and subdivided and sub subdivided and it's um in the way it's it's being uh, handled and that's 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 the concern it's not Anyway, I think that's what I said. I, um, I, 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 need to, I need to move on to my next meeting, but I thank you for joining me. Um, I wanted to highlight the idea that, um, that, that we accept the idea of disobedience, that sometimes it can be active and sometimes it can be passive, that we understand the value of majorities and violation of dignity and heartfelt principle that our approach is one which accepts the authority of the law and the fact that sometimes we have to follow bad laws and pay the price for violating rather than saying, you know, we can say you know, I'm violating because it's the right thing to do, but you nonetheless, you nonetheless have to accept sometimes the authority of law and recognize that society needs to be governed, but that the people en masse have a responsibility to try to make themselves listened to and to negotiate change for a moral improvement. Um, and that even as Caligula, Caligula had to accept with Petronius, sometimes you don't get it your own tyrannical way um, and you need to bow to what is right. Um, may our leaders, followers, and people find peaceful resolutions to deep felt hurt and, 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 and issues that need to be addressed. And may everybody here have a happy afternoon. Thank you very much indeed.